Amazingly, the whole history of Israel in the Old Testament is a complete prefigurement for the entire history of the Catholic Church, right up to our present day, in great detail and in chronological order. For a short 9-minute summary video that demonstrates this amazing act of God, watch this video. For a deeper look into these parallels, see our YouTube channel, Maccabean Uprising, and also visit our webpage at www.maccabeanuprising.com. Before we examine the two witnesses found in the 11th chapter of the Book of the Apocalypse, I would like to offer an idea. The Old Testament contains the entire history of the Israelites. The Israelites were the Old Testament people of God. Their entire history from start to finish is completely contained in the Old Testament. Similarly, the New Testament is the entire history of the new people of God, the Catholic Church. We are still in the New Testament, even though our history is not recorded entirely in the Bible. If the old prefigures the new, then it makes sense that the entire history of the Catholic Church would be prefigured by the Old Testament. Would this prefigurement continue all the way to the end of church history? Elevated to the papacy, Angelo Giuseppe Cardinal Roncalli. He will reign as Pope John the 23rd. This video will build on our last video, Beast Out of the Sea, Apocalypse Chapter 17, which in turn was built upon a previous video entitled, Prophecy of the Seventy Weeks of Years, from Daniel Chapter 9. That video was based on our pivotal video, Vatican II and Novus Ordo, prefigured in the Old Testament. The central concept and the keystone on which this video will base its conclusions is the understanding that the abomination of desolation in the books of the Maccabees is a prefigurement for the Novus Ordo Rite. To see how the abomination of desolation is a prefigurement of the Novus Ordo, refer to our full-length video, Vatican II and Novus Ordo, prefigured in the Old Testament, or refer to our video, Vatican II and Novus Ordo, prefigured in the books of the Maccabees, a short summary. The Maccabean Uprising Project is dedicated to showing how the entire history of Israel in the Old Testament is a chronological and detailed prefigurement of the history of the Catholic Church, all the way up to our present day. If this is true, then these parallels can be very useful and instructive for us. In our previous videos, we used the parallels between Novus Ordo and the abomination of desolation from the Old Testament book of the Maccabees. In order to shed light on the prophecy of the 70 weeks of years found in the book of Daniel, which in turn sheds light on the seven-headed beast out of the sea from the 17th chapter of the book of the Apocalypse. If you haven't already done so, we highly recommend you first watch our video Prophecy of 70 Weeks of Years from Daniel chapter 9, and then watch our video, Beast Out of the Sea from Apocalypse 17, before you continue with this video. From the foundation laid in those videos, we can move on to see how the two witnesses from the 11th chapter of the book of the Apocalypse can be understood using the identification of the seven-headed beast out of the sea and how he gained power over God's people. In this video, we will identify the two witnesses, show how they gave witness, show how the beast killed them, 
show how the people of the earth were happy that they were dead, show that they were brought back to life, and show how the people of the earth were filled with great dread at seeing them come back to life again in the streets of the great city. Like the prophecies found in the book of Daniel, the visions of St. John in the book of the Apocalypse very likely have multiple meanings as well. One of the most common understandings of the symbolism in the book of the Apocalypse is how they relate to the end of the world and the final passion of the Catholic Church. Traditional Catholics use the name Book of the Apocalypse. Another name for this book is the Book of Revelation. Here is a very basic and general description of the concept of Apocalypse from Wikipedia. An apocalypse, literally meaning an uncovering, is a disclosure of knowledge or revelation. In religious contexts, it is usually a disclosure of something hidden, a vision of heavenly secrets that can make sense of earthly realities. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, the revelation which John receives is that of the ultimate victory of good over evil at the end of the present age. The following verses from the book of the Apocalypse are taken from the Dewey Reams Bible. The verses pertaining to the two witnesses come from the 11th chapter of the book of the Apocalypse, verses 1 through 13. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and it was said to me, Arise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar of them that adorn therein. But the court, which is without the temple, cast out, and measure it not, because it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city they shall tread under foot for two and forty months. And I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire shall come out of their mouths and shall devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, in this manner must he be slain. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them into blood, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the abyss shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was also crucified. And they of the tribes and peoples and tongues and nations shall see their bodies for three days and a half, and they shall not suffer their bodies to be laid in sepulchres. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them that saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying to them, Come up hither. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. And at that hour there was made a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. And there were slain in that earthquake names of men, seven thousand. And the rest were cast into a fear, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Before we examine these verses, it would be very helpful to briefly recap our previous videos. The concepts from our past videos are crucial for identifying the two witnesses. In the video Vatican II and Novus Ordo, prefigured in the Old Testament, we examined how the books of the Maccabees are a prefigurement for the events leading up to and surrounding Vatican II and Novus Ordo. Not only are the Old Testament books of the Maccabees a prefigurement for recent church history, 
but the whole history of Israel in the Old Testament is a seamless chronological prefigurement for the whole history of the Catholic Church. Near the end of this complete chronological prefigurement is the striking parallel between the abomination of desolation in the books of the Maccabees and the Novus Ordo Rite. Once the Novus Ordo is identified as the abomination of desolation, then the universal implementation date of Novus Ordo on November 28, 1971 can be applied to the prophecy of the 70 weeks of years from the book of Daniel. This date allows us to identify the time period of the final week in that prophecy. This, in turn, gives us a key to interpret the seven-headed beast out of the sea from the book of the Apocalypse, because it can be shown that the time period and events in the final week of Daniel's prophecy are the same period of time and same events that transpire when the beast out of the sea gains power over God's people. So now, we are ready to examine the verses concerning the two witnesses from chapter 11 of the book of the Apocalypse. In those verses are various periods of time that transpire, in which the holy city they shall tread underfoot two and forty months. From the eleventh chapter of the book of the Apocalypse, verse two. And I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. From chapter eleven, verse three. It is immediately recognizable that those two periods of time are the same as other periods of time mentioned in chapter 12 and 13. The woman is fed in the desert. This is done for 1,260 days. The woman is given eagle's wings and she flees to the desert where she is fed for a time, times, and a half time. And the beast out of the sea with seven heads whom is given power to overcome the saints, and power was given to him for forty-two months. Upon examination, we can determine that all three of these various periods of time describe the same amount of time, but just in different ways. 1,260 days is the same as forty-two months, which is the same as a time times and a half time, or three and a half times. Thus, when we compare the actions of the beasts from the abyss in chapter 11 with the actions of the beasts from the abyss in chapters 12 and 13, it appears that it is the same event that gives the beast power in both instances, namely the universal implementation of Novus Ordo on November 28, 1971. Let's reread the verse about the testimony and death of the two witnesses and how they will be brought back to life again after three and a half days. And I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the abyss shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord also was crucified. And they of the tribes and peoples and tongues and nations shall see their bodies for three days and a half, and they shall not suffer their bodies to be laid in sepulchres. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them that saw them. If we see the two witnesses as having been killed by the universal implementation of Novus Ordo on November 28, 1971, and we then go forward a period of three and a half days, or years, from that date, we come to a very significant event that occurred in Rome. On May 25th and 26th of 1975, which is only two days short of being exactly three and a half years after 
November 28, 1971, Archbishop Mar Marcel Lefebvre led a traditional Catholic pilgrimage to Rome. This event is not very well known, but it is very significant. Here is our summary of an article that appeared in the June 23, 1975 edition of the Remnant newspaper from an eyewitness source. A link to the text of the whole and original article will be provided in the description section of this video. We highly recommend that you follow that link and read the article for yourselves. On May 25th and 26th, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre led his seminarians and other devout Catholics to Rome for the Jubilee year of 1975 on a pilgrimage known as the Credo Pilgrimage. The four major basilicas in Rome needed to be visited in order for the pilgrims to gain their indulgences for the pilgrimage, these being St. Peter's Basilica, St. John Lateran, St. Paul Outside the Walls, and St. Mary Major. The Credo Pilgrimage visited these four basilicas and three others, the Basilica of St. Lawrence, St. Sebastian, and the ancient ruins of the Basilica of Maxentius. Pilgrims from all over the world who came for the Jubilee year were astounded to see in each of these basilicas the traditional Catholic faith and liturgy was on full display and was alive and well. At each of these basilicas, a devout and majestic procession was made while singing traditional Catholic hymns. The Tridentine Mass was said in each basilica, and the Archbishop gave addresses to the vast crowds, sometimes numbering into the thousands. It is estimated that over the course of the Credo pilgrimage, and among the four major basilicas and other minor ones, that over 100 Tridentine Masses were sung. Pilgrims with other groups, and some Roman clergy as well, were quite overwhelmed by the scale and fervor of this pilgrimage. The Credo pilgrimage demonstrated to all those in the streets of Rome that traditional Catholic faith and liturgy were alive after their destruction by the Novus Ordo. The pilgrimage was not viewed positively by the Vatican, who communicated a message of regret in their newspaper, Le Observatorio Romano. Thus, in the city of Rome, after having been absent for three and a half years, the traditional Catholic faith and traditional Catholic worship, the Mass and other traditional pious devotions, were on full display, vigorous and alive. These two witnesses to the Lord are connected and go hand in hand with each other. Pope Pius XII tells us in his encyclical on sacred liturgy, Mediator Dei, Legem credendi lex statuat supplicandi, which means that the law of prayer determines the law of belief. Therefore, if either faith or liturgy is affected, then so is the other as a result. Pope Pius XII, in that same encyclical, refers to how faith and liturgy give witness. He says in paragraph 47, The entire liturgy, therefore, has the Catholic faith for its content, insomuch as it bears public witness to the faith of the Church. Here is a more lengthy quote from paragraph 48. Since the liturgy is also a profession of eternal truths, and subject as such, to the supreme teaching authority of the Church, it can supply proofs and testimony, quite clearly, of no little value towards the determination of a particular point of Christian doctrine. But if one desires to differentiate and describe the relationship between faith and the sacred liturgy in absolute and general terms, it is perfectly correct to say, Lex credendi legem statuat supplicandi. Let the rule of faith determine the rule of prayer. Thus we can see how the liturgy is connected to our profession of belief, and how they give witness and testimony to God and His Church. That is why these two witnesses died with the introduction and implementation of Novus Ordo, which changed the sacred liturgy of the Church. During the pilgrimage, 
Archbishop Lefebvre addressed the pilgrims on multiple occasions. He also spoke of the witness of faith and liturgy. Here are some quotes from his sermon that he gave on May 25th at the Basilica of Maxentius, in the heart of the Roman Forum, in the very heart of Rome. If there is one day on which the Church's liturgy affirms our faith, that day is the Feast of the Blessed Trinity. Thus the martyrs believed, who lie buried everywhere in this basilica, and in all the churches of Rome, who suffered here in this forum. And shall we be afraid to affirm our faith? We would not in that case be the true descendants of the martyrs, the true descendants of those Christians who shed their blood for our Lord Jesus Christ in affirmation of their faith to him. So may our presence here in Rome be an occasion for us to strengthen our faith, to have, if necessary, the souls of martyrs, the souls of witnesses, for a martyr is a witness, the souls of witnesses of our Lord Jesus Christ, witnesses of the Church. When you return to your homes, you may have the courage, the strength, despite difficulties and despite trials, to remain true to your faith, come what may to uphold it for yourselves, your children, and future generations, the faith which our Lord Jesus Christ gave to us, so that the pathway to heaven may still have many pilgrims, that it may still be crowded with people on their journey upwards. The two witnesses testified for 1,260 days, before they were killed by the beast. On February 11, 1929, the Catholic religion became the state religion of Italy. Traditional Catholic faith and worship could and were freely and openly professed in Rome and in Italy in general. Thus, the two witnesses were able to give their public testimony unobstructed. Forty-two years later, they were both destroyed by the Novus Ordo. They were publicly absent from Rome for three and a half years until Archbishop Lefebvre brought them back to Rome on May 25th and 26th, 1975. All the modernists in the Vatican were horrified to see the traditional Catholic faith alive and well and drawing such huge crowds. With the implementation of Novus Ordo, the modernists were very happy indeed at having achieved their goal of eliminating the traditional Catholic liturgy and faith. And one can imagine that they were making merry and giving gifts to each other after their success. The traditional Catholic liturgy and faith tormented the modernists because it convicted them of their errors and heresies. Likewise, we then can imagine the dread that must have come over them when during the cradle pilgrimage that occurred all over the city of Rome, the traditional Catholic liturgy and faith came back to life again in the streets of Rome, drawing huge crowds. In the last verse in the narrative of the two witnesses, it states that at the hour in which the two witnesses were brought back to, li to life in the streets of the great city, a great earthquake struck the city. It is our opinion that the reference to this earthquake is a metaphor. Here is the portion of verse 13 concerning the earthquake. And at that hour there was made a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. It is extremely interesting to note that on the last day of the Cradle Pilgrimage, the largest earthquake of 1975 struck off the coast of Europe. It was an extremely powerful earthquake reaching 8.1 on the Richter scale. We don't think this earthquake in 1975 is what the Book of the Apocalypse is referring to because the earthquake in the Apocalypse is most likely a metaphor. However, it appears that God allowed this earthquake to occur on the last day of the Cradle Pilgrimage to more completely show that the Cradle Pilgrimage of 1975 is connected with the biblical text of the two witnesses. Here is a quote from Wikipedia. 
1975 North Atlantic earthquake occurred on May 26th. The epicenter was located in the North Atlantic in an area between the Azores, Iberian Peninsula, and Morocco. It had a magnitude of 7.9 or MS 8.1. Here is that same earthquake appearing at the top of the magnitude chart for that year. It was the strongest earthquake of 1975, and it occurred on the last day of the Credo pilgrimage. One of the biggest objections to this interpretation of the two witnesses is that Elijah and Enoch are widely accepted and anticipated as the fulfillment of this vision of St. John. We will examine the parallels between Archbishop Lefebvre, the Cradle Pilgrimage, and the prophet Elijah. Also, we will examine the metaphorical connection between Elijah and Enoch and the traditional Catholic liturgy and faith. Further, we will show how other Old Testament stories and passages are also related to this passage about the two witnesses. In particular, we can look at the rededication of the temple by the Maccabees and the book of Zechariah. Before we examine the parallels between Elijah the prophet and Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and the Credo pilgrimage, here are the footnotes concerning Elijah and Enoch from the well-reputed Catholic Hadock Bible. The reason why we chose this Bible is that the Dewey Reims gives very little footnote information concerning this passage, and the Hadock Bible gives copious amounts of useful footnotes. Verse 3, My two witnesses shall prophesy 1260 days. It is a very common interpretation that by these two witnesses must be understood Enoch and Elijah, who are to come before the end of the world. It is true this is what we read in several of the ancient fathers, insomuch that Dr. Wells, in his paraphrase, calls it the consent of the primitive fathers. And in his notes, says, it is of unexceptionable authority. This opinion, at least as to Elias, is grounded on those words of the prophet Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elias the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and also of the words of our Savior Christ, where he tells his disciples, Elijah indeed shall come and restore all things. But I cannot say that the consent of the fathers is so unanimous as to Enoch, for we find by St. Hilary that some thought Jeremiah would come with Elijah, and he himself thought that with Elijah would come Moses. See his commentary on Matthew, page 710 of the November edition. Secondly, allowing it as received opinion that Enoch and Elijah are given are again to come before the day of judgment, yet it is not the constant doctrine of the ancient fathers that by these two witnesses in this place of the Apocalypse must be understood Enoch and Elijah. St. Cyprian expounds it as two sorts of martyrs for the Catholic faith, to wit, they who suffer death, and others who only suffered imprisonment, loss of goods, and the like. Others expound it of the testimonies concerning Christ and his church, of which some are in the Old Testament and some in the New. To these, who, to these we must join all those interpreters who expound all the visions and predictions in the Apocalypse, till the 20th chapter 
of the persecutions raised by the Jews or by the heathens against the church, which have already happened. Of these, both as to ancient fathers and later interpreters, see Alcazar in the Prolangomena, two witnesses, it is commonly understood as Enoch and Elijah. From this footnote, we can see that certain saints of the Catholic Church believed that the two witnesses don't necessarily have to be Enoch and Elijah, and others believe that Enoch and Elijah could have could also be viewed in a metaphorical sense instead of a literal sense. With that in mind, let's look at the parallels between Elijah and Archbishop Lefebvre. In the Old Testament, the apostate Jewish king Ahab and his wife Jezebel, the daughter of the high priest Baal, had all the prophets of the true God killed. Elijah alone escaped. He was the last true prophet in all Israel. After Vatican II and the implementation of Novus Ordo, all the bishops of the Catholic Church either went along with the changes or quietly went their own way. Archbishop Lefebvre was the only bishop to fight and to openly refuse the changes. The Lord shut up the heavens for three and a half years, during which time there was no rain. This was done because King Ahab and Israel following him started to worship Baal. Elijah fled to the land of Sidon, a pagan land, where he fed a widow there during the drought and famine. After the implementation of Novus Ordo, there was no more grace rained down from the Tridentine Mass. This was because Paul VI and the Catholics following him only used the Novus Ordo rite. Archbishop Lefebvre fled to Switzerland, a Protestant country, where he fed Catholics around him with the Holy Eucharist during the drought and famine caused by the extinguishment of the Tridentine Mass. After three and a half years of famine and drought, Elijah met his adversaries on Mount Carmel. Here he proved that the God of Israel was the true God. He also gained the support of the people and led them back to the true God. On that day, rain finally fell again on Israel after three and a half years. After three and a half years without the Tridentine Mass, Archbishop Lefebvre led the pilgrimage to Rome, face to face with the Vatican, his adversary. Here, he said the Tridentine Mass all over Rome, and he gained the support of so many pilgrims who were there and were so thirsty for the Tridentine Mass. After three and a half years, Catholics were given hope, knowing that their holy religion wasn't dead. On Mount Carmel, Elijah had to rebuild the altar of God. He was the only prophet for the true God of Israel. However, the prophets of Baal were many. During the Credo pilgrimage, when Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre said Mass, he used the traditional Catholic altars, which apparently were unused since the implementation of Novus Ordo. He was the only traditional Catholic bishop However, the Novus Ordo adhering bishops were many. Here is a quote from the third book of Kings, spoken by Elijah. These words can easily be imagined to have been thought and said by Archbishop Lefebvre. And he answered, With zeal have I been zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, they have thrown down thy altars, they have slain thy prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Separate from the parallels between Archbishop Lefebvre and Elijah, there are also general parallels between sacred liturgy and Catholic faith and Enoch and Elijah. The two witnesses of traditional Catholic liturgy and belief 
can also be seen as Enoch and Elijah in a metaphorical sense. Elijah was ardent in his belief and worship of the true God. Traditional Catholic liturgy expresses an ardent faith and is zealous in the profession of that faith, just like Elijah. The traditional Catholic Mass has the power to shut up the heavens, like Elijah, insomuch that the Tridentine Mass, far more than anything else, draws down grace from heaven. If the Tridentine Mass is not said, then the grace does not rain down. As for Enoch, there is very little written about him in sacred scripture. All we know is that he walked with God and God took him. He was pleasing to God, which is why he was taken. Similarly, we can say that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And finally, and very briefly, we can see Archbishop Lefebvre's Credo pilgrimage as paralleled by the rededication of the temple by the Maccabees and in the book of Zechariah. In other videos, we have demonstrated many parallels between Archbishop Lefebvre and Mathathias, the founder of the Maccabean Revolt. The Maccabees succeed in taking back Jerusalem and the temple after it was desecrated by the Greeks for three years. They rededicated the altar and performed the true Old Testament sacrifice for the first time since Antiochus set up his second altar and mandated his new pagan sacrifice. During the rededication of the temple, they lit a seven-branched candle, which has become the symbol of their success. Like the Maccabees, Archbishop Lefebvre marched back into his holy city, Rome, with a large army of priests, seminarians, and faithful. During the Credo pilgrimage, he took back the city of Rome. He visited seven basilicas, and he relit the candles on the traditional Catholic altars. He performed the traditional Catholic sacrifice, which wasn't seen in Rome since the implementation of Novus Ordo, a new rite on a new second altar, just like Antiochus had done in the Old Testament. And from the Old Testament book of Zechariah, there is a verse that mirrors the book of the Apocalypse almost verbatim. From Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And he said to me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, and its lamp upon the top of it, and the seven funnels for the lights that were upon the top thereof, and two olive trees over it, one upon the right side of the lamp, and the other upon the left side thereof. We can see that in this Old Testament passage, the candlesticks and olive trees, just like in the book of the Apocalypse. The difference, however, is that in this passage, it states the candlesticks had seven funnels. Thus, we can make a loose connection that isn't as concrete as others, but it's still very interesting. Archbishop Lefebvre is paralleled with Mathathias and the Maccabees. The Maccabees lit a seven-branched candle when they conquered back Jerusalem and the temple. The passage in Zechariah uses the same language as the book of the Apocalypse concerning the two witnesses. In the book of Zechariah, the candle has seven branches. During the Credo pilgrimage, Archbishop Lefebvre visited and said Holy Mass in seven major basilicas in Rome. He relit the candles on the traditional altar, perhaps for the first time in three and a half years. The Credo pilgrimage is arguably connected to the passage about the two witnesses who are called olive trees and candlesticks in the Book of the Apocalypse. We would just like to point out that this interpretation of the vision of the two witnesses 
is distinctively Catholic. It exposes the Novus Ordo and points to the Tridentine Mass and the traditional Catholic faith. Since the Bible is really a Catholic book, it would make sense that possible meanings of the symbols in the Book of the Apocalypse directly relate to the traditional Catholic faith of the ages. Please stay tuned, for there is much more to come.